We did the math today. Same two speakers as last year. Together, there is 140 pounds less preacher than there was here a year ago. He's lost 92 since last year at this time, and I've lost 48 since last year. There's 140 pounds. We've lost an entire minister. There is an entire, a whole preacher is missing. Whatever part he lost, he didn't lose the part that preaches, I can tell you that. What a great word today. Amen. Amen. I um, give honor tonight to our host, to the marshal and district board and just everyone that allows us to be here and to Brother Atkins and the men's committee. Thank you so much. And I am very honored to get to be with you tonight. I say that sincerely. And I, I love to get up and have a little fun like this. But I, there is an intense burden in my spirit to preach tonight. Very, very, very significant, and I don't say that lightly. I don't. I shouldn't. They, they, I shouldn't even say that because, because that'll manifest itself when I preach. I don't have to verify that to you. But um, boy, I've got something to say for us tonight. Really do. Really do. Uh, I want to read tonight from First Samuel chapter five. First Samuel chapter five, and I will read beginning in verse number one. Amen. First Samuel chapter five and verse one. Thank you so much for being here and taking time and finance and everything else that it takes to come. I know it's, it is a sacrifice for you to be here, and, and, and you could be home doing yard work, and you sacrifice that to be here. Uh, you, you could be home taking your wife to the mall tomorrow, and you sacrifice that to be here. Uh, did, did anybody notice the clever ploy that Sister Marshall employed? Oh, honey, you need to buy those boots. That is the cleverest ploy our wives ever do. Oh, honey, spend the money, spend the money. Yeah, right, because then how are you going to look at her and say, no, can't buy that. But you limited her to 25 bucks. That's pretty good. You did good. First Samuel chapter 5 and verse number 1. The word of the Lord says this, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. It's kind of a sad situation when you have to prop your God up. And... And when they arose early on the morrow morning, the second morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off, the Bible says, uniquely upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, I had an old Bible school instructor that always said, when you see the word therefore, you need to see what it's there for. Therefore, because they witnessed what happened to Dagon, it says, therefore, neither the priests of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. They saw something happen there, and they took great pains never to step in that place where change occurred. And I'm going to preach tonight by the help of the Lord. Don't jump the threshold. Don't jump the threshold. And you don't know what I mean right now, and that's okay because I ain't got to it yet. The Lord's going to help us. Would you do me a favor? I, I, I leaned over to Brother White a few minutes ago. I said, do you feel the same weight? I, there's, just, there's something very eternally significant about what's happening here today. I, I wish you'd put your Bibles down and lift your hands and your voices to God and cry out that God would change you tonight. Would you do that? Ask God to change you tonight. Now, you better not pray that if you don't mean it. Because God might do it.
Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Now, Lord, if you don't, gentlemen, if you don't shout amen to this first statement, we're going to be here a long time. There, see, there's a threat. There's a threat. I believe in the power of the gospel to change lives. Man, somewhere in this house, there's a witness that said, I came into church one way. I'm not the same guy I was when I got there. Now, I don't know your testimony, and I don't know where you came from, but I guarantee you if I passed the mic around, somebody could say, you wouldn't even know me if you could see me where I used to be. Somewhere in here, there's somebody that knows what all men of alcohol taste like, but it's only in your memory because God sets you free from that one. Somewhere there's an ex-drug addict that knows everything in the street, but today you're a different man because the power of the gospel changes life. When I was fresh out of Bible school, I was green as grass, and, and, and my pastor one Sunday was gone because he was going to general conference, and, 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 and I was in charge, <laughs> and I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and, and, and I got up Sunday morning and preached, and, 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 and even God didn't know what I was trying to say. It didn't make a lick of sense. And and, 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 and and church was done, and everybody left, and, and nobody came to the altar, and, and, and I had to run to the hospital to go see folks, and I took off and ran to the hospital, and I came screeching back in the parking lot about 4 o'clock, trying to figure out what I was going to preach that night. And I, I, I preached that night, and it's just like everything I said went out over the pulpit and just fell in a little pile there on the floor. I swept it up and put it in a file and figured I'd sort it out and make a sermon out of it later. And, 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 and I mean, I, I gave the altar call, and, Three people laughed, and that was about all the response we got, and, and, and you're dismissed. I told my wife I hadn't eaten breakfast, I hadn't eaten lunch, I hadn't eaten supper, I hadn't eaten all day, and I told my sweet wife, I said, go home and fix breakfast, and start on lunch, and I'll be there shortly. And, 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 and most folks left, but, you know, I got half a dozen folk that just, they wouldn't move in the service, and now they won't move after the service. I can't get them out the door. I'm passing out coats, you know, here's your coat, what's your hurry? And about that time in the back door he came. A gentleman who was highly inebriated. He was drunk as a skunk is what he was. And I'm sure at some point he had had a bath, but it had not been any time recently. And one of my those gentlemen that's there came to me and said he wants to see the pastor. I said, the pastor is at general conference. He said, I know, that's why we're bringing him to you. Thank you. And they paraded that guy up to me, and then all six of them folks that wouldn't leave, left. And I took Otis back in my office back there and sat down. I had an office about the size of that table right there. And I sat on one side of my desk, and he sat on the other side. Everybody's gone home. Nobody in that building, me and him. There ain't a light on except the one little bare bulb in my office. That's it, me and him, right there. And I looked over at him, and I said, well, what can I do for you? And he said, today is my birthday. Happy birthday to you. I said, well, happy birthday. And then because it's a guy, I can ask him what I can't ask otherwise. I said, well, how old are you? He said, 176. I said, you wear it well, sir. You don't, you don't look a day over 150. You're doing great. I, says, I said, 176, are you? And he said, yes, sir. I was born on, and he gave me that date and the year 176 years ago. And I thought, man, you're drunk, but you're good at subtraction. You're good. That's, that's awesome. Right there, that's good. And I said, well, I mean, I'm glad you're here. Happy birthday. You know, I said, so what, what, what brings you here? Now, did I mention that it's just me and him? And we're in a dark church with one light bulb and ain't nobody there but me and him. And he looks across my desk and says, I've killed 43 men and I want to know what to do about it. We 
didn't have a class on that in Bible school. But I'm going to tell you, Brother Marshall, the Lord gave me an answer for him. I looked at him and said, stop! Let's just leave it on an odd number, okay? Stop right there. That's good. Man, at that point, I'm thinking, Jesus, I, I'll fast the rest of the day if you just get me out of here alive. I've, you know, I've almost got the day done at this point. I said, you said, you said, <clears throat> you said, you've killed 43 men? Yes, sir. I didn't know what to ask next. I, I said, w w w how do you, uh, you uh, I said, where has this been happening? He said, in the skies over France. He said, I was a tail gunner in World War II. And one night on a stormy night, a, car, a flight came up behind us, and I thought it was the enemy, and I shot it down, and there were 43 of my fellow soldiers in that plane. I killed every one of them. And he began to weep, and he said, I have lived every day with guilt on my head. I can remember him just slapping his head. He said, it's guilt. It's just can't get away from it. He said, preacher, I've tried every alcohol out on the street. I've drunk it by the gallon. I've crawled inside one whiskey bottle after another, but every time in the morning when I wake up, it's still there. He said, I've tried every drug they sell on the street. I've been so high, I didn't think I'd ever come down. But when I came down, that guilt is still there. He said, I've tried therapy. I've tried support groups. I've tried hypnosis. I've tried acupuncture. He said, I've tried I've tried every religion known to man. I've been in every church. I've tried Christianity of every stripe. I've prayed the sinner's prayer in more altars than you've ever seen, preacher. But he said it didn't matter what I've done. Every time I get done, it's still there. And he said, but somebody told me there was something different about this church. said somebody told you right I told him about the power of the cross and the wonder of new birth that old drunk fell out of that chair on his face on the floor I got down beside him and he started repenting and after about 15 minutes he opened up he was completely sober And he said, now what, preacher? I said, come with me. I walked him out to the baptistry, got him a robe. I took him down in the water. I put him down in Jesus' name. Listen, listen. And when he came out of the water, his eyes got big, and he said, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. And that's all I understood because then he started talking in tongues. I'm just telling somebody there's something about this gospel. It changes life. There is nothing like this gospel for changing life. In fact, I would say to you, if this church is not an agent of change in people's lives, it's nothing more than a religious club. The day the church cannot offer to the broken lives that come through its doors, a remedy for both the cause and the effects of sin, then its purpose is hopelessly shallow. It has at that juncture become a museum for saints instead of a hospital for sinners. But that is not the case of his church. In his church, the gospel of Jesus Christ still changes lives. And we will proclaim that gospel until he comes. In fact, I would preach to you that anyone who walks in the church 
better expect to change. Oh, I'm not suggesting that every guest who parks on our lot and crosses our doors comes in understanding or anticipating that some type of eternal shift is in their spiritual future. They, in many cases, probably do not even understand that such a change is possible for them. Offering that hope and facilitating that opportunity is our responsibility every time they come in the doors. But rather, gentlemen, I preach to us. We who have tasted the power of God to change lives must never expect that worship in His house is not about change. That we don't come there just to feel His presence. That we don't come there just to enjoy his blessings. But I rise to confront you tonight with this fact. We born again, Holy Ghost filled, men of God must realize that every time we come to the house of God, God wants to work change in us again. Oh, I'm going to preach. Regenerate change is not just the gift offered to the unchurched. It is not the exclusive possession of those who are still bound in sin. It is and must be the anticipated consequence of every worship encounter. Somebody better preach with me. Every time we come into the house of God, we better understand that God did not design for us to leave the same way we came. You hear me right now. If you came to Bowling Green and you really thought you were going to go home like you came, you better hear this preacher right now. That's not God's will. You're not here to laugh at a cowboy hat. You're not here to just eat good food and fellowship. God said when you leave this place, I want something different in you than when you If you're not willing to have that, you better leave now. If you're not willing to change, you ought to just go on up to your room and, and do whatever it is you want to do. But if you're going to park your hind end in this room, there's something eternal in this house. Yeah, I'm telling you in an unction of the Holy Ghost, God wants to work a change in you. Every time we come to his house, some area of our thinking or some area of our behavior or some area of our conduct or some area of our devotion or some area of our consecration is to be altered by exposure to his word and to his spirit. I must be changed. You must be changed. I can't stay the way I am. We can't stay the way we are. We must hunger for God to change us. It, it is a grave and dangerous condition to resist change. I have noted in recent days a disturbing trend across the face of the church. And yes, even in the congregation that I'm so blessed to pastor, there is a mindset of contentment with who and what we are. Until we who come to church come with very little anticipation that God is going to work anything substantive in our lives on that night. 
We arrive with the full expectation that we will leave just as we came. And for the most part, God's people seem to be okay with that. You know why? Because we look at what we used to be and we say, I'm so much better than that. I don't need to change. I would to God you'd get your eyes off that as your measuring stick. Start looking at Jesus. Look at what you could be and say, I have to change. It starts simply and perhaps even innocently. We're tired. We're discouraged. We're weary and well-doing. So we come to a church service and we just sit one out. There's really no reason to praise tonight. I'll just watch others. There's no reason to deeply worship this evening. I'll just spectate tonight. There's no reason to shout amen to the preaching. Other people can encourage him tonight. There's no compulsion to hasten to the altar tonight. I'll go the next time. There's no desire to linger in prayer. I think I'll just go home. There's no passion to be perfected because I'm not all that bad. There's no hunger for change because after all I'm already born again. I'll just go home like I was. I came here saved. I'll leave here saved. I'm no worse off than I was. I'm still the same man who came to church. How bad is that? And I suppose in one sense it doesn't seem all that bad. But hear me. One detached worship experience leads inexorably to the next. And one missed altar call makes the next one that much easier to avoid. And one time of fighting off conviction makes us better at fighting it off the next time. And one moment of quenching his spirit perfects that talent in us until one service becomes two and two become three and three becomes a month and a month becomes a year and a year becomes a life of static Christianity and we become quite proficient at coming to church and not being changed hear the voice of this preacher tonight we must be the Bible says we go from glory to glory we go from faith to faith and we are transformed into his image not all in one moment of divine creation but through the ongoing process of sanctification and if we hear me right now if we are not moving toward Jesus if we are not growing in him if we're not allowing his presence to shape us in every service then we are indeed slipping into the grave of complacency and self-deception When's the last time conviction got your heart so hard that you couldn't even wait till the preaching got done to run to the altar? That's what sinners do. When's the last time preaching pierced your shell so deeply that you could not stop the flow of hot tears dripping down your cheek. And you did not care about the very carefully crafted Pentecostal facade that you have worn. And you really didn't care who saw you. And you really didn't care what they thought. Because there was something burning inside of you to get closer to Jesus Christ. When was the last time, preacher, that preaching moved you like you wanted to move your saints? Well, I have to maintain an image in front of my people. Sorry, Pastor. You don't think they know you're human? I have great reverence and respect for leadership and for pastoral ministry. But I'm telling you, there's got to be some transparency in this house. When I look at him, I have to fall on my face and say, God, I've got to be changed. I'm sorry, but I didn't drive five hours to pat you on the head and hold your hand and let you laugh at my string tie. I came here tonight with an intense burden in my spirit that the Holy Ghost...
Ghost wanted to say to somebody, it's been too long since you were broken. It's been too long since you changed. You've gotten comfortable with where you are, and there's so much farther for you to go. I can't reach a point in my spiritual journey where I can say I've matured enough I don't need anything else. If the Apostle Paul could say, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but I leave those things which are behind. I'm not comparing myself to what I used to be anymore. I'm looking forward, and if by any means I might apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is no way I can ever come to service with a smug attitude that says I don't need anything more. I've heard all the preaching. I've sung all the songs. I've prayed all the prayers. I've done all the work. Now I can just idle my way into eternity. That mindset is a curse, whether it occurs at 20 or at 40 or at 60 or at 80. Any opinion of I've arrived is actually a testimony to spiritual blindness. Because thou sayest, he said to that church, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. In other words, the way you see yourself might not be how God sees you. Well, we're so proud of our Pentecostal pedigree and hook our thumbs in our suspenders and say, I'm thank God that I'm not like the publican man. And all the while that man's beating himself on the chest saying, just God be merciful to me. And the Lord said, I'd rather have a church full of publicans that desire to be changed than one self-righteous. Than one self-righteous old guy that thinks he's already arrived. Give me a church full of men that know how to get to the altar. Give me a church full of men that run up there with tears running down their face. God, give us a church full of men that are desperate. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, I must be changed. I am compelled by the Spirit tonight to preach to the echoes of His voice in your soul. To speak to those forgotten moments when his spirit beckoned you to his side. To call you back to the hunger you once knew. To offer to you the same blessing that is afforded to the rankest of sinners that walks in his house. The gift of change. For a foundation in the scriptures, I take you to a dark season in Israel's history. Israel is laboring in a season of ungodliness due to Samuel's son's corruption of God's ways. They were living in sin and uncleanness, and God's judgment is against them. Up in my room a little while ago, the Lord began to speak to me. I started scribbling some more notes in here. I don't know if this will make any sense, but I'm going to tell you what the Lord spoke to me. Believe it or not, I, I don't live for your approval. Please note that such is always the case. God's judgment is against sin. His judgment is against unrighteousness whenever and wherever it may be. Don't you believe for one second that God is unaware of secret sins? Don't you, be don't you believe for one second that the eyes of the Lord do not pierce the darkness around you? Don't you allow the enemy to convince you that your public image is of more consequence than private character? I don't care if you sit on the platform, on the back pew, in the sound booth, or somewhere in between. You must hear me that God's forbearance and God's long-suffering is not to be confused with His approval of your wickedness. Who do you think you are, you little snot? I'll tell you who I am. I'm the man that God sent in this house tonight to confront you. I am the voice that God sent to confront you tonight before he unleashes your judgment in your life. I am the voice that God sent to sound a warning in your life to tell you he knows everything you're doing and there is an opportunity for you tonight to repent and change. But if you do not heed this word... There is a judgment coming into your world that is going to thunder in ways you never imagined.
I need somebody to help me pray right now. I'm up against it. But I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, the voice of the Lord is speaking in this house, either in this life or in the life to come. But just as surely as he lives, his righteousness will demand an accounting for sin. And he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Hide behind your cloak of religion if you will, but I'm telling you, we've got to be changed. Come on, we need this tonight. I wish you'd begin to let your voice out in this place a little bit. I wish you'd begin to let your voice cry out a little bit. I, I wish some of you come up here and lay hands on somebody, pray with one another. I just wish you'd walk in the Spirit a little while tonight. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. I know every one of us needs to change, but please don't just be a spectator. 